Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. We're just about ready to get started here. My name is Sal and I'm on the product marketing team here at MyoVision. Really excited to be your host for this webinar this afternoon. We've got some incredible guest speakers on the line today. We'll be looking at ways in which we can improve the fan experience from a slightly different lens than most people would consider, but I'm sure we'll all be able to relate to and selfishly, this is a problem that I've fallen victim to time and time again. Most recently in this past weekend when I was in Toronto watching my favorite sports team play. I'm sure you can guess based off the context of this webinar, but I was stuck in traffic for way longer than I was hoping to be stuck in traffic for. So very topical for me personally, and I'm sure it's something that we'll all be able to relate to. Now, before we get into the webinar, just a few quick housekeeping items. Everyone's mics have been muted, just so myself and my co-presenters have a clear line of communication. We'd love to hear from you if you've got questions or comments. So there's a section on the tool where you can post your questions and comments. Now, time permitting at the very end, we'll hopefully be able to field some of those questions. Now, just to give you a quick high-level overview and what to expect with the webinar, first and foremost, we'll be looking at the ecosystem of city staff, consultants, engineers, who work together to create, measure, and implement traffic management plans. This is where you'll hear from our first guest speaker, Paul Askin from the Ottawa Sports Entertainment Group, to learn about how he and his team have really been collaborating in the city of Ottawa to drive innovation with the traffic management plans. From there, we'll pivot into a conversation on how intelligent transportation systems and automated traffic measurement tools can be used to enhance the modern TMP specifically looking at how the data from these tools can be used to not only help inform, but also drive continuous improvements in the TMP to enhance the overall fan experience. And last but not least, we'll hear from our friends from Burns McDonald. They're an engineering firm based out of Kansas City, Missouri, to learn about how they've worked with a stadium out in the Midwest, save millions of dollars of infrastructural expansions just by leveraging observational data from an automated traffic measurement tool. With that, let's dive right into it because traffic in the fan experience, traffic in the guest experience, we'll be using fan and guest interchangeably throughout the course of this webinar, but I'm sure this is a problem every single one of us has experienced at one point or another, whether it's going to a local ball game to watch our favorite sports team play, hitting up an annual conference, multicultural get together. All of these major events have a significant positive impact on our communities. Of course, there's that added vibrancy from them. There's that economic boost felt by them. But practically all of the significant downsides that come from hosting these major events deal with traffic. It's just, it's sheer chaos when you have massive amounts of people arriving and subsequently leaving a localized facility at the exact same time. Now, I mean, if you had one event once a year with a massive surge in people, you could potentially write this problem off, throw it on the back burner because it would be an edge case. But the reality is it's not just the volume of people attending a singular event, but the cadence, the frequency with which you have multiple events happening. So, I mean, picking on a city close to home for us here at MyoVision HQ, looking at the city of Toronto, in the heart of their downtown core, they have about five major venues. Now, looking at the last calendar year, each of those venues brought in a total of 350 events. So over the course of a calendar year, if you were going into the city of Toronto on any given day, there was a very high likelihood that a major event was taking place. All in all, these events brought about 6.2 million additional people into the city, which averages out to about 18,000 additional people on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, that 18,000 represents the average over the course of a calendar year. The reality is we know that major events don't occur in silos and you can have a cumulative effect when you have multiple events happening on the same day. So for example, what happens when you've got the Toronto Blue Jays, that's our MLB team, playing the same night as our Toronto Raptors, who of course, shameless plug here, won the 2019 NBA championships alongside having a Taylor Swift concert in town. Now you're looking at volumes of 50, 100, 150,000 people imposing stress on an already densely populated urban city, imposing stress on existing infrastructure, transit, and logistics. 
So factoring all of this in, it, it really does become clear that this really is a systems level issue. There's multiple people impacted across the value chain. You've got your residents and commuters, the very people whose day-to-day -day lives are being disrupted because of these major events. They're people who didn't sign up for the problem and are unfortunately having to deal with it, kind of like collateral damage, if you will. There's the city officials and event executives, the people whose phone lines and email inboxes are just blowing up because residents and commuters are driving up complaints. You've got the fan and guests who are also issuing complaints to event executives. In fact, about 20% of people who run major events have prioritized transportation and logistics as a key thing that they want to improve in the overall fan experience because of the sheer number of complaints and the feedback that they've been receiving from people. Then there's traffic teams, people like yourselves in the audience who work in traffic operations, who work with engineering firms and data collection firms who are being tapped on the shoulder by these city officials and event executives to help find a way to remedy the problem. And last but not least, you've of course got the fans and the guests, the very people who are paying out of pocket to go and watch their favorite team play, to go and watch their favorite artists perform. At the end of the day, these individuals don't really care. They don't want to have to stress about traffic. They just want it to work. They're buying tickets for the entertainment value. And unfortunately, there's countless examples you can see on the screen there of how traffic and congestion has been a severe deterrent in the overall fan experience. And it's reasons like this that about 42% of fans have demanded on their executives or fan executives that they want better parking, they want better logistics, they want better transportation as a way of driving up the overall fan experience. So you can see that there's multiple stakeholders involved here. And for those of you on the line, you already know that traffic alone is a very challenging problem to solve. When you throw in the added variable around major events, it's really important and it becomes really clear that in order to solve this problem, you need to tap into the ecosystem of support at your fingertips, working with engineering firms and data collection firms, working with people in the city and traffic operations, working with event organizers and working with technology vendors to build out a really robust traffic management plan that can ultimately enhance the fan experience. But I'm gonna pause there because I think this might be a great time to introduce our first guest speaker, Paul Askin from the Ottawa Sports Entertainment Group. Paul, it's, uh, it's really great to have you on the line here. I know when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, we were really excited and it seems like your team's doing a lot of great stuff in the city of Ottawa. Why don't you take it from there? Tell us who you are, the work that your team's doing and share your experience with us. Absolutely. Uh, so thanks for having me, uh, really excited. Um, so my name's Paul Askin, I'm the director of public safety with the Ottawa Sports Entertainment Group, obviously. Uh, so my background is security and public safety. Uh, I came on board with OSEG in 2014 at the end of our redevelopment uh, phase. So I'll get to kind of the history behind the site, um, but we've, we're our fifth year now um, from a site that's, you know, takes its history from, from the end of the uh, 19th century. Um, so OSEG owns three sports franchises. Um, so we, we have a CFL team, a USL and an OHL. So we do football, soccer and hockey. It's a mixed events, uh, it's a mixed use site. Uh, we host about 100 events a year uh, with about 3.8 million visitors annually is our estimate. Uh, we're hoping to get that up to 5 million visitors um, over the next couple of years. Uh, so coming from security and public safety, um, in 2017, uh, when OSEG hosted the Grey Cup and the NHL 100, uh, both events that attracted over 30,000 people each, that was kind of when I got my start into transportation planning. Um, so I have to give credit to uh, to our to our, our transportation demand manager uh, who now works back with Stantec uh, for as an associate transportation engineer, uh, Hassan Madun. Uh, was a big part of all all of the uh, the things that I'm going to go over. Um, so uh, maybe Sal, maybe we could go back to the development context uh, slide. Uh, so just to get a sense of of where we are in the city of Ottawa. Uh, so the the neighborhood's called the Glebe uh, near Old Ottawa South. Uh, so we're south of a major highway, uh, but we're we're smack in the middle of a of a very urban, gentrified, um, you know, kind of anti-development uh, council ward. Um, so so you know, it's really sensitive to the impact traffic has on on residents, um, people living in the area. 
uh, and, and sort of the, the, the pressure that, that the events that a place like uh, mixed use stadium has on people nearby. Um, so moving, moving to the next slide, we've got just a, a sort of a picture of, of what Lansdowne looked like um, tail end of uh, uh, 1898. Uh, so the Aberdeen Pavilion um, was sort of the centerpiece of, of the old Lansdowne. Um, so the historic grounds were established in 1847 with the pavilion built in 1898. Uh, so as the site evolved, um, we, there were additional buildings uh, and then a stadium grandstand put up. So over the next sort of century or so, you can kind of see the site uh, take form. Um, so the next slide shows uh, the site continuing to evolve. And the big piece here is paved surface parking. And that's a that's a really important piece to, you know, from the past of Lansdowne, how that's fed into where we are now. Um, so, you know, prior to the to the redevelopments, um, uh, so we reopened in 2014, but the the amount of surface parking uh, was just massive. Uh, so the south stands of the old Lansdowne had to be torn down and redeveloped. Um, so there's a long sort of construction period. Uh, but 2014 was our was our grand open uh, back into the to the new Lansdowne. So we'd been without a CFL franchise for a number of years. Um, the neighborhood kind of through those years had changed quite a bit. Um, the sort of transportation patterns, that type of thing. Uh, so 2014 for us was a a brand new team of people that didn't necessarily have experience in the sports and entertainment industry. Uh, it was kind of a, a new challenge for the city of Ottawa in that our sports franchise, the NHL franchise is out uh, in Canada, which is sort of a far out uh, suburban neighborhood in Ottawa, plenty of parking all around it. Didn't really have the kind of need for the transportation programs that a place like TD Place does um, given, the, given the neighborhood that we're in. So this is an image of, of what the new Lansdowne looks like. Um, so a renewed emphasis on green space, uh, a nice big urban park off to the east of the site. You can still see the Aberdeen Pavilion um, dead center there. So, you know, that's a couple buildings there that we're not allowed to touch or change. They're both heritage buildings. Uh, so the Aberdeen Pavilion is one. And then kind of in the northeast corner, it's a building called the Horticulture Building. Uh, so the site now is a is a mixed use. Um, so what that is is TD Place Stadium and Arena, kind of the centerpiece of this, uh, and then a a residential and retail components, uh, which is hugely important for us. Um, so we've got a number of unique restaurants and bars, uh, and then we have a, a a large condo tower, and then a slightly smaller condo tower on the other side of the site, uh, with a number of townhomes um, bordering the north edge. So it's, it's occupied 24-7. Um, like I said earlier, we do about 100 events a year in the stadium, uh, but Lansdowne Park, which is a city-managed uh, park, obviously, uh, has a number of, of uh, a high number of events throughout the year as well. So the Aberdeen Pavilion, the Horticulture Building, and the park itself uh, are continually rented out as well, just for, um, you know, community events. Um, generally sort of a different, you know, business plan than, than what we do. Uh, but, but you know, what, what we kind of learn through this business is even those quote unquote small events uh, can, have a, can have a really big uh, traffic and pedestrian impact. Um, so the next slide uh, just, just illustrates the difference kind of from, from where we were to where we are. So the redevelopment, uh, this is a picture of the old site. The redevelopment took away 3000 plus uh, surface parking spaces. Um, so you know, we generally assume two, two and a half people per car. Um, the, the old CFL franchises, you know, they weren't attracting sellout crowds. Um, current capacity at TD Place is 25,000 people. Uh, so, you know, even in the old days when we had 3,000 parking spaces, uh, for the most part, most people were able to park in the neighborhood or on site. The new site, as you saw in the past pictures, all of that, all of that uh, parking space has become uh, the urban park. So it's a completely different site than it was for you know the past number of generations through the city, uh, which is a, which is one of our big um, you know transportation demand management challenges uh, that, that we've encountered. Um, so we'll move on to the the. the Just bear with us here, folks. Paul's trying to reconnect, so we can get his audio back on. Hey, sorry. Uh, can you guys hear me? There we go. You got to love technology, right? <laughs> That's it, right in the middle. Uh, sorry about that, everybody. So uh, moving on to our, our TDM strategy. Um, so just on, a, on my next slide here, so I, I'm, so I'm going to talk about um, sort of how the city of Ottawa uh, intersects with our, with our transportation demand management planning. 
Uh, so we have a we have a, a program in place in the city, uh, and this was born out of a number of events where uh, you know things didn't go perfectly. Um, so this is a this is a city committee that sits to ensure that event planners are kind of checking all the boxes off. Um, and then if we aren't, or if we don't know what we're doing, especially you know 2014, when we're brand new to this stuff, um, they have the ability to advise, and then it's an approval process. Uh, so what they call this is SEAT, which is the Special Events Advisory Team. So any outdoor event requires this approval. There's generally a sort of number threshold, but they're always available as well for support. Um, so if you're doing an event that you've never done before, where you have questions and you're looking for subject matter experts, the city of Ottawa does a really good job um, providing that type of support. Uh, so in 2014 and, and you know through every year, it's a yearly annual approvals process. Uh, the traffic management plan is a huge component of this. Um, given the impact that our events, uh, you know, minor events, major events in particular have upon the neighborhood and upon the city at large, um, it's very important that, you know, all these emergency services and city services are tied in uh, properly. So in 2014, uh, the plan was developed in conjunction with um, City of Ottawa Traffic, uh, OC Transpo, which is our local municipal uh, transit provider, and, and STO, uh, which is sort of Gatineau, Quebec. Um, Ottawa's proximity to Gatineau is very close, so we do service a, a decent amount of people coming over the bridge. Uh, and then the other important piece of this um, is the National Capital Commission. So the, the layout of Lansdowne. Um, so we have Bank Street on the west, uh, which is a city roadway, and then on the east, we're bordered by a, a parkway. Uh, and then parkways have, you know, obviously a number of challenges, uh, given the fact that they're not designed to be, you know, quote unquote roads, it's parkway. So, uh, you know, left turn signals, um, generally advanced signals aren't in place. Uh, they're just, they're not designed the way our, our, our normal roads are. So in 2014, uh, we had an in-house transportation demand manager. So I mentioned him earlier, Hassan Maduna works for Stantec now. Uh, so he was part of the team to, you know, to develop and launch this program. Uh, and we also worked with SP Plus Game Day, uh, who came in to operate our park and shuttle program. So moving on to the next slide, uh, just to give you a sense of our modal share targets. Uh, so this was developed in 2011, uh, which you know to this day amazes me that somebody, uh, people much smarter than me, are able to look to the future uh, three years prior to open and predict um, sort of the, the needs that we're going to have. Um, so these studies that were done by the City of Ottawa, uh, given the you know the redevelopment context, um, it was important that we had sort of outside people looking at this. Uh, so it was broken down basically uh, between a so, so under 5,000 person event, um, which for us generally we can accommodate most of that through surface, uh, not surface parking, uh, underground garage parking, of which we have about a thousand available spaces, or nearby neighborhood parking, which we have lots and lots of available space. As we move up to the 10,000 number, um, we start to unlock things like enhanced transit. Um, so what that means is the existing transit routes along our major transit corridor of Bank Street uh, would be increased. So additional buses, um, quicker turnaround routes, higher capacity. Once we hit the 15,000 mark, that's when we unlock um, our, our special uh, transit series. So that's the 450 series, uh, which basically just means, you know, Canada, Barhaven, our suburban far out neighborhoods that are 30, 40 minute drives sometimes um, connected via transit way. Uh, have have you know direct shuttles, so it's a much quicker system to get downtown as opposed to having to do three or four bus routes sometimes. And the other big piece of this is our park and shuttle program. So the difference between these is um, 450 series OC Transpo is city buses, and then the park and shuttle is actually our uh, so you know yellow school buses basically where we where we pick up a lot of additional um, surplus. Uh, super events was our our peg for Grey Cup. Um, so even in 2014, so you know 2011, looking forward to the opening in 2014, we had an agreement to host a Grey Cup within five years. So we were basically planning for that, you know, super mega event uh, right out the gate. And the, the high end of that was 40,000, which we ended up getting uh, 36,000. So if we go on to our uh, modal share targets grid on the next slide, you can see sort of what we were aiming for here. For the most part, conceptually, the numbers are, are still fairly accurate. Um, there was a little bit of a split between transit and park and shuttle. Uh, so the emphasis in 2011 expected more, more people to come on park and shuttle versus the city buses. Um, walking and cycling, you know, fairly consistent. And then our, and our on-site parking, so those 14,000 uh, ended up being uh, slightly lower just given the way the garage was configured. Um, so moving on to TDM implementation. So uh, on the next slide, I've just got some of our, our challenges that we that we expected coming into this big one. Um, average football fan is not a transit user. And Ottawa is a heavy driving city to begin with. 
uh, with an emphasis on bringing yourself wherever you're going. So people generally don't trust the transit system to begin with. So that was a challenge we were playing with. The old behaviors from prior to the redevelopment uh, with those 3,000 parking spaces is something to this day, people still complain about why do we get, a, get rid of all these parking spaces? So five years in, we're still dealing with those questions. Uh, so that was obviously a big problem in 2014. Um, and, and looking at just the, the neighborhoods, uh, so I mentioned the parkway, um, sort of lack of high order transit and surplus roadway capacity was a challenge too. What we looked at, uh, and this is a story I tell whenever we're doing these, the emphasis on parking shuttle and transit is, you know, if somebody doesn't enjoy their experience on the buses, they're not likely to try it again. What they're going to do then, they're going to still come to the event, but they're going to drive their own car. Then they're going to further uh, influence negatively the, the experience of people that are continuing to try the bus programs. And then that vicious cycle just compounds on itself until nobody rides the buses at all anymore. So it's very important that we always focus and prioritize the buses. In. So our keys to success, um, branding and marketing, integrated trip planning tools, and direct and targeted communication. Uh, from day one, we understood that if we weren't able to, to check this stuff off, then these programs weren't going to work, uh, especially with something like a Grey Cup, where we looked at a 55% diversion over to transit and park and shuttle. Uh, so when you're talking about 36,000 people, that's a huge number to put on transit, park and shuttle with the limited roadway capacity we have nearby um, TD Place. Uh, so on the next slide, I've got an example of some of the branding and marketing that we do. Uh, so what this is, is just, you know, it's it's branded marketed stuff that we're sending out, that we're sending to people. Uh, so what we do is pre-game emails. So if you buy a ticket online, we have your information. We're going to send you an email with a bunch of quick hits um, based on what you can expect coming to the game. And a huge piece of this, obviously, is the uh, transportation stuff. Um, so they're general advisories. And then on the uh, next slide, I've got an example of our day-to-day. So what we do here is just knowing that you know we have a large retail resident uh, uh, population on site um, is to make sure that the people that live here that work here um, are, are kept in the loop and are provided with alternatives to single occupancy vehicle trips. Uh, we have a 96% occupancy in our commercial and retail uh, space on site. Um, so this is you know this is a pretty decent population that that we found uh, great success in reaching out to as well. Um, the next slide has examples of our integrated trip planning tools. Uh, so this is another example of a partnership with the city service. Uh, so OC Transpo develops these web pages that we then link uh, through to with our transit information, but also our private park and shuttle. Uh, so they've created dedicated websites for Lansdowne and TD Place, uh, non-event days versus event days, which lists the 450 series, the park and shuttle times, all that stuff. Uh, next slide is an example of our, our targeted communication. So the example I give with this is in 2014, um, we took your postal code, if you were a season ticket holder or a casual buyer, and we sent you customized messaging um, locations uh, for the nearest um, park and shuttle service or the transit service. So what we did with this is it's, is it's outreach. We're not waiting for people to come to us with questions. We're, we're, we're flying out to them with the right answers. Anything we can do to try to divert people over to um, alternative modes of transportation. Uh, so we'll just move on quickly then to the uh, modal share review. Um, so what I've got here is our, our examples from 2014 to 2016. So this is where I mentioned the flip, 55% uh, transit shuttle utilization, but we saw a higher uptick on OC transit, city buses. They're easier to navigate through the city, uh, but our park and shuttles is still a, a big chunk of, uh, of people coming to site. Uh, the next slide is, shows our 2016 to 2018 breakdown. Uh, where you can see that the numbers uh, remain consistent. So five years in, we're still seeing the same kind of uh, bus and transit utilization. 2016 in Ottawa was the start of ride sharing and Uber. So that's always been a bit of an unknown for us that we're still working on year to year. City of Ottawa doesn't officially recognize ride sharing. So that's been a big challenge with the setup of platforms that type of stuff. Um, and then I'll quickly finish off just with what we're seeing in our, in our future trends. Um, so the focus here is uh, looking at neighborhood utilization, where else can we park cars uh, while still continuing to divert as many people as we can to transit, park, and shuttle. Uh, trying to solve this ride sharing thing with the City of Ottawa. Um, our cap our uh, taxi partnership doesn't allow us to put ride sharing on site as well too, so trying to solve for that one. Uh, light rail is coming to Ottawa allegedly at the end of the summer, uh, so we've been waiting for that one for a while too. It doesn't necessarily connect to Lansdowne, but it does kind of bridge the gap um, from the outlying areas. 
And uh, finally, just, you know, example of, of, you know, sort of city working in our benefit here is a footbridge that was installed over the canal uh, just this past summer, which has unlocked a whole ton of additional neighborhood parking. Challenges, obviously, with that is that now we're impacting another residential neighborhood with tons of on-street parking. So every year is a little bit different for us, um, but we're, we're currently developing our next sort of five-year plan. Um, so that's kind of where I think our, our, our working with MyoVision comes in. As we're, we're we're very interested in sort of statistics of kind of how that stuff feeds into the, the planning process. And that's it for me. Awesome, really great stuff, Paul. So many so many interesting nuggets to take away. I mean, looking at the collaboration you have with your team in the city, the emphasis on data. One thing that stood out to me, and this is again very topical. But you mentioned poor behavior is often reinforced. So if people have a poor experience with transit, they're definitely going to drive the next time around. When I went to Toronto this past weekend, I actually drove into the downtown core. It was a terrible experience. So to your point, I think you know your audience really well. I'm definitely going to jump on the subway next time around to avoid the pain of uh, sitting in traffic. But um, quick question that I have for you. When you look at it, so much of the work that's done in sports is driven by data. I mean. Pulling on the story of Moneyball and Billy Bean using data to decide which players to purchase, where they should play, even using data to decide where your concession stands should be placed so you can drive up revenue. I bring that up because I know when you and I were speaking a couple of weeks ago, you had mentioned that there's an individual on your team who's handling business intelligence, whose job it is to live and breathe data. I'd be curious to learn, how do you bring him into the fold when you're building out your traffic management plan? Yeah, absolutely. So we, so we have a, a business intelligence um, department. Um, so, there, so there's a director, I think he has two staff plus an intern. So OSEG's taken really seriously statistics um, right from day one. So, and I think they internally, we've all learned a lot since none of us knew what business intelligence meant five years ago. Um, and now, you know, I still don't really, but we're getting a better sense of it. Um, what we do with with these with you know especially the transportation planning is um, is surveying every guest that comes here. Uh, so even if we're getting a a twenty percent um, completion rate for this, it's kind of validating especially these modal share assumptions. Um, you know twenty percent is not hundred percent, but some stats are better than no stats, and that's that's the uh, that's sort of the motto of that department. Um, so we use this stuff in terms of our our annual TDM report back to the city that Stantec completes for us. Uh, the, the vast majority and the bulk of that, which then guides our, our planning stages, comes from statistics that are gathered primarily from surveying, but also from uh, pedestrian counting that they've done in the Glebe and that the city's planning on doing uh, on the QED side as well. Um, so I think for me, someone who's not from the transportation world, not from an engineering uh, background, um, it's it, it blows my mind the amount of conclusions we can draw uh, that that you know year after year seem to be really really accurate. Uh, that comes out of sort of this business intelligence statistical analysis stuff. Um, so so we use it. Uh, you know we we have a it's called NPS Net Promoter Score. So it's the way we kind of uh, survey people. Were they happy? Are they likely to promote our sporting teams? Uh, so it guides our business plans. It guides our staff behavior, identifying problem areas where we can get better. And then from traffic management, um, yeah, it's it's incredibly important. Uh, and I think it's it's a huge important piece. Uh, that I'm that I'm very glad we were we were kind of on the forefront of um, when we started to put this into play uh, five years ago. Awesome, I think data is going to be a key focus for this presentation moving forward. But with that, let's uh let's continue on and look at how tools can be used to enhance the modern TMP. You know, you heard from Paul, data really is the name of the game here. I think. You know, our industry in particular in traffic is fairly notorious for making large scale change with very small subsets of information when arguably it should be the other way around, using a lot of data to help inform small changes which can drive large scale impact. And this is where multimodal data is a shared functionality that we have with our temporary solution, MyaVision Scout. Scout's essentially a portable camera that can be used in a much more ad hoc manner. It's something that will provide you insights into travel time as well as multimodal counts. Scout is meant to be moved around. It's a portable solution and doesn't require as much collaboration with the city because it's not housed within the traffic cabinet. 
So as an event organizing team, if you want to use this to say measure um, pedestrian flow within the actual stadium, this is a potential use case with Scout. You could use it to decide where you should best position your ride sharing apps, or it can help you identify specific choke points in the stadium, all potential applications of a more portable solution. I'm gonna leave it at that though, because we actually have some folks on the line from Burns McDonald, Paul Plotus and Timothy Cope, who have some firsthand experience working with MyVision Scout to help inform recommendations around a stadium. So Paul, Tim, thanks so much for being here today. We're really excited to have you on, on the line. I know when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, we were really intrigued with the work that you were doing at Arrowhead Stadium. So why don't you take it from here, introduce yourselves and, and tell us about the work that you've done. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm Paul Flotis uh, with Burns McDonald. I have uh, about 30 years of experience uh, with, with traffic engineering. Um, and Tim's here with me. Go ahead. Yes, Tim Cope. Um, about four years of experience also at Burns McDonald um, working underneath Paul. All right, so the project, uh, Jackson County approached us uh, with, uh, with, with a concern that, that both the, the chiefs and uh, the, the county had with pedestrians uh, bypassing the bridge and crossing a, uh, a heavily traveled road with uh, uh, after after ball games. And as you can see in the figure, the, the bridge that we're talking about is between the the main part of main parking area of the stadium and what we're calling lot L. And so what we did is um, they're, they're actually their first approach to us was um, with the solution of what's going to cost to put it in a second bridge or can we widen the, the existing bridge? We talked to them about um, a different approach to the project and actually quantifying what the what the problem actually is. And uh, Tim will be will take over from here and, and talk about a bit about what we did um, for this this actual project. Yes, sure. And um, if we could proceed to the next slide. And so after Jackson County had presented to us the the problem that they were receiving complaints about and experiencing. Um, and we had suggested taking more of a quantitative look at what sort of pedestrian behaviors are going on that they experience after the, um, the full capacity games at Arrowhead Stadium. Um, we first took a site visit, sort of just taking a look at the pedestrian path that goes from the stadium to Lot L and um, looking at it as an element by element basis to sort of see what what's going on and also you know what areas do pedestrians have to go through to go from the stadium to lot L. And so on this figure, the chief the Arrowhead Stadium is on the top left of the screen and lot L is at the bottom right. And so really what we did was just notating um, you know different path issues going on. So sort of at the beginning of the path there's a bit of a dog leg that leads to a pedestrian tunnel um, that's connected by stairs and that tunnel then leads to pedestrian bridge that crosses Sportsman Drive. Um, each of these are about seven feet wide and then at the end of all of that is another stairwell with an additional 25 or so steps that lead to a landing um, on Lot L. And so really to note the issue that Paul was describing is that Sportsman Drive is one of the primary entry and exit points for parking to the stadium. You see the toll booths just west of the bridge and so for beginning leading up to the game all the lanes are used to enter traffic and then preceding the game um, all lanes are used to exit traffic so lots of lanes to cross there especially for a jaywalking pedestrian and so that's that's really what we're trying to inhibit there and so if we could uh, proceed to the next slide um, what we were able to do with myovision also a uh, gawalt hamilton the help us setting up these cameras. So we were able to position cameras for the after portions of a game and really observe what was going on. So these videos were crucial for determining sort of these prescriptive elements. Um, you can see the primary pedestrian path they're describing there highlighted in yellow. Um, but really what we did was just position nine separate video cameras just to record from the end of halftime 
up until about midnight of the game that was chosen. So some things to note about the specific game that was um, that we collected data at. It was the AFC Championship match of uh, earlier this year, uh, Chiefs versus the Patriots. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the, the game, this actually ended up in an overtime loss for the Chiefs. And so uh, for a sellout crowd could not have experienced a more worst case scenario for um, observing these um, pedestrian activities. So in our sense, the best case for seeing the pedestrian behaviors of what, what would occur. So if we could proceed to the next slide. Um, really the, the meat of this project was um, comparing the side-by-side -side videos um, so that we could see overall what is going on and, and see what sort of um, decisions people are making. So this slide here is an example of that showing from left to right um, sort of the primary path of what we're observing. Um, unfortunately, we were able to get the videos to work on the webinar base, but we have still images showing the types of views that we're looking at. And um, what these videos were used just to really spot out the individual aspects going on throughout the pedestrian path. Um, and so if we proceed to the next slide, one of, in a sense of developing sort of these individual point analysis um, findings, uh, one thing to note, for instance, at point number four, this is at the pedestrian tunnel entrance, uh, early on preceding the match is that we noticed that there's a capacity choke point at the top of the stairs. Um, you can see in the image in the upper left that there's a huge group of folks trying to get to the stairwell that are being held up by people positioning themselves to proceed down the stairwell while um, the groups going down the stairs are experiencing larger gaps. Um, you know, seven minutes later on this image to the right, you see that other issues are causing the queue to extend into the stairwell. And so sort of making that issue alone a moot point, but still important for the grand scheme of trying to figure out each individual element that's going on in the pedestrian path. And then if we proceed to the next slide, um, really at the crux of the issue that Paul was describing earlier um, was the jaywalking across Sportsman Drive. So using the MyoVision videos, we're able to sync all of these up via the timestamp and really be able to see overall what's going on crossing the road. So um, can't quite see it in this image, but uh, later on, proceeding across Sportsman Drive, there's masses of people that end up crossing um, the roadway with the oncoming traffic. And so um, able, yeah, just really be able to measure and observe what sort of those behaviors are going on. And if we proceed to the next slide, um, from these videos, we're able to start developing quantitative measures. And so one of the first things we looked at is, is there some sort of acceptable queue link that people are deciding to basically sit in line for to get um, through the pedestrian walkway? And if, if there's some point that people decide to start bypassing uh, the queue going to the tunnel or bypassing the queue entirely and starting to walk down the hill and go jaywalk across Sportsman Drive. Um, and so from these findings and all the different camera views, you're able to see that that was approximately 720 feet. Um, essentially that first major crosswalk leading to the path that um, proceeds to the pedestrian tunnel. Um, and so that seemed to be pretty stagnant uh, for as a decision point for pedestrians, but also looking at it in a terms of timeline, the game had concluded at 9.13 p.m. Um, it took about seven minutes for the mass of pedestrians to reach the walkway that we were studying. And then from there, it was about another 12 minutes until what we had called the pedestrian bridge capacity failure, or um, in other terms, when people decide to start jaywalking across Sportsman Drive, uh, it was about 12 minutes to reach that point. And then that lasted for approximately 15 minutes. And so there was a 15 minute span when people were illegally crossing Sportsman Drive under traffic. Um, after the game. And then all in all, the last pedestrian crossing the bridge, um, sort of in the, the larger group, was at 10.08 p.m. So the entire span of events here was le a little less than an hour, um, but then the point of interest is about 15 minutes from people who were jaywalking across Sportsman Drive. And so if we proceed to the next slide, um, 
a very handy thing we were able to do with the with the video data was we were able to collect five minute pedestrian count data. And so I'm not going to touch on too much on the slide, but the biggest things to note is that um, when we're looking at Sportsman Drive, we found that approximately 500 people total decided to cross um, via jaywalking. And that's a, definitely not a number to take for granted, but in considering the full extent, as um, what Paul was describing earlier, is that lot L under full capacity is expected to service about 10,000 people. And so in the grand scheme, it's a very small percentage of people that were trying to um, change their behaviors, but also it's definitely um, no number to take for granted and definitely needs to be, um, be considered. And so if we uh, proceed to the next slide, um, another aspect we were able to do that the facility managers found very useful was starting looking at pedestrian travel times. And so we were able to pinpoint people in the multiple video frames and determine based off of the timestamp travel times. And so a um, couple things to note from these findings is that from the tunnel entry point going to lot L, um, at that duration it was described as a capacity failure for the bridge, that travel time was about four minutes and eight seconds. Um, under a free flow condition, it was under two minutes, but looking at a similar time frame for folk wanting to um, jaywalk, that was reduced to roughly a minute 30. And so that's really what the county was up against on trying to either disincentivize people from jaywalking so that they decide to cross the bridge legally or improving operations on the bridge such that the breakdown travel time reduces such that fewer people decide to go forward with jaywalking. Um, so that's really the balance act, balancing act of Jackson County. And so if we proceed to the next slide, through the study, we're able to develop a handful of, first of all, key findings. Um, one of that was the first item that we had uh, walked through, which was that tunnel entry point with the configuration of both the, the pathway as well as with the stairs. Um, that was creating a pinch point before anything else on the, the pedestrian. And so that's definitely an item to look into individually, but also tied to that, there is um, denoted by the arrows of a lot of hill, what we call hill cut through traffic occurring just before the bridge, essentially people jumping in front of the line um, to access the bridge in front of the people that were waiting in the tunnel to cross the bridge. So um, that was one of the key findings that was severely impacting the travel times for people within the tunnel. Um, but then finally, the last, that final stairwell at the bridge terminus, um, that really was the ultimate controlling factor for the flow rate off of the bridge. And so um, essentially that's the originating point for the queues. And so that's where improvements could definitely be seen is if those stairwells were improved to allow for a higher flow rate. And so from there, we were able to develop a uh, list of recommendations. Um, if we proceed to the next slide. Uh, and so in general, really what these focused on was increasing the flow rate of pedestrians through the travel path without considering, you know, um, addition of a new bridge or basically what individual items could be uh, performed to help improve the existing sort of layout of the pedestrian path. And so a lot of these focus on elimination of stairways. Um, People tend to walk a bit faster at a higher density on pathways rather than stairways. And so things as simple as converting a stair to either a switchback or an extended pedestrian ramp, um, that would help increase the rate of flow and allow more pedestrians to be serviced through the similar, the same amount of time. Um, some other recommendations were to consider positioning security personnel at key points along the hill just to to be present and visual so that um, people think twice before making the decision to jaywalk across Sportsman Drive. Um, but also there were some prescriptive elements as simple as, as point number six of removing portable restrooms from the landing area of lot L. So maybe um, spacing those out throughout the parking lot instead of having in the consolidated area so that people lining up to use the restrooms uh, would not impact the people trying to exit the 
the um, pedestrian crossing bridge and blocking those wanting to, to get to their vehicle. And so with that, uh, I'll just pass it back for Paul uh, for a few um, final takeaways. Yeah, so, and so we presented these um, recommendations to Jackson County and, and uh, with uh, the caveat that, you know, remembering that this is happening only um, for, you know, they have, four, they have eight home games for the Chiefs per year and that these crossing events where pedestrians are, are, are most likely gonna cross Sportsman Drive, those are happening only when you have close games and you've got a lot of pedestrians leaving at the same time um, near the end of the game. So, you know, it's happening eight times a year at the most and, and for a 15 minute window where we have pedestrians. So, you know, considering all of that, what they've decided to do was to pick a few of these um, alternatives and or recommendations and they're and they're making some of those improvements right now um, and uh, the, the the NFL season is, is getting started here uh, in the next couple of weeks or so and what we're hoping to do is to get out there and um, take a little bit get a little bit more information um, with the with the crowd, um, and and quite honestly, the data that we collected and the way that we did this analysis, I mean, we really couldn't have done it any other way than, than with the cameras and the the videos that Tim showed earlier, where we had three or four simultaneous camera views going at the same time. Those were especially helpful for the, the folks at Jackson County to understand. Okay, this is what the issue is. This is what the fans, the pedestrians, uh, are experiencing at different points uh, along the route, um, and that was that was very helpful to to have them understand what was going on. So, uh, with that, I, I we've uh, that's our presentation on uh, the Airline Project. Awesome, really great stuff. I mean. <sighs> I remember when we spoke and still even now watching you present it to think that fans were crossing an eight lane highway to go and watch their team play to avoid traffic. I mean, I don't know if I would call that loyalty, but that is, that is just, that is just nuts to me. I mean, it's such a big safety concern when you have so many people crossing a highway like that, you know, I think, it's interesting with your study because so much of it was fueled by observational data, by qualitative data. And I know when we spoke a couple of weeks ago, there was one particular thing that you had mentioned that really popped out. You know, you, you had mentioned along the pedestrian bridge, one key thing that you noticed was, you know, when it was raining or if it was bad weather, puddles would actually form on the pedestrian bridge, which was reducing the level of service on the bridge, which is causing even more congestion. I mean, it's hard to find insights like that without video, but when you presented that to Arrowhead and when you presented that to the city, what, what was their reaction? I'm just curious. That, and actually the puddle in particular, you can see in the video where the folks, uh, the pedestrians are going from three wide, three or four wide to one wide because the one of the puddles in particular is right at the bottom of, of a set of stairs and the people were not wanting to, to have their final step be on ice. And so they were scooting around to the outside. So it was just a, it was just a, it's, it's an additional pinch point that um, it's not always obvious, but it was just one of those simple things that's just, I mean, it's just, once you see it, it's like, oh, of course, that's that's an issue. We got to get rid of that. That's a safety issue, as well as uh, 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 an operations capacity issue for for the whole operation. So, um, yeah, it was just one of those things that it, it, it was just a, a, a pretty cool observation. Um, that, I mean, really, it, it was it was uh, it was just it was just neat, and it was good to see that we we actually caught it on video too. Yep, absolutely. And I mean, investing to enhance the drainage system versus building 
you know, a $10 million pedestrian bridge. I think the numbers just tell you what to do there, right? Um, right with that, right. we have come to the end of the content section of the webinar. Thank you once again. We hope you all have an amazing day and uh, until next time, cheers.